Okay, so welcome to the program today. We're celebrating Rosa Luxemburg. We're here with um, Dana Mills. So first I'll introduce myself. I'm Rory Martirana. I am a reference and adult learning librarian at the Ives Main Library at New Haven. Um, and Dana is a lot of things, but also the author of, of the book, um, Rosa Luxemburg, which we have right here. But Dana, I'm gonna let you um, speak a little bit about yourself. So uh, thank you so much for having me and welcome everyone. And I hope you're keeping well and safe wherever you are. Um, I'm really, really pleased to be here. Today is a very special day because today is 102 years since Rosa Luxemburg was assassinated. So it's important to say, um, we remember her. I remember her, we remember her every day, but today especially, and in light of recent events, I think it's actually a very special anniversary and we'll get to that as the story unfolds. Um, but a little bit about myself and how I got to write this book. Um, I'm half Israeli, half Welsh. I'm currently based in Tel Aviv in a strange Airbnb. So it's always weird to do these, the wonders of Corona time. Um, but I grew up in Israel where I joined the human rights movement when I was 13. And um, as a Jewish woman who was always skeptical about the concept of the nation state and what nationalism means, um, Rosa Luxemburg was the person who was always in our kind of in our intellectual horizons and in, in my intellectual environment. And um, I've been an activist ever since I'm 13. I'm still involved in a lot of things happening here. This is home for me. Um, I've lived in the UK for 12 years, and I lived there through Brexit, through all the events that are unfolding there right now. And I'm currently teaching in Amsterdam, so um, I'm kind of like in many places. And I think being raised also bilingual and binational, you kind of think about what it means to be internationalist, what it means to be in the world. Um, and especially for me, being an Israeli pro-Palestinian activist means that I always consider my role in history. I see myself as speaking from the wrong side of history. I'm never, for me, politics is not an emancipatory thing. For me, it's not a joyful activity, but it's rather something that you do because you have to, because there's a moral calling there. Um, so that's about myself. And um, in the Q&A, if anyone wants to ask any, anything about my weird trajectory, you're also welcome to, because people are always curious, so that's fine. Uh, but I want to talk about Rosa because she's the main person here and she summoned us to be with her today. Um, Rosa Luxemburg was born to a Jewish middle class family in Poland under the Russian Empire in 1871. So she was twice an oppressed citizen, once, actually three times, once as a Jew, second as a Pole under empire and third as a woman. So for her, she was always an outsider. She was always speaking from the margins, really. Um, her upright, upbringing basically coincided with a very big push in um, attempting to get Polish independence from the Russian Empire. Um, now, a little bit of Marxist history, this is just like a nutshell of what's important to realize. The idea that Poland would be the first place where the Russian empire would fall is something that was inscribed in Marx and Engels. It's a very long idea in the Marxist tradition held by Marx himself, then his daughter, Elena Marx. And a lot of Polish revolutionaries at that time thought as well that if Poland would become independent, then the Russian empire would fall and a socialist revolution would start all around Europe. However, Rosa and her comrades disagreed with this idea and saw nationalism in and of itself as a dangerous thing. So as a very young teenager, maybe 13, 14, she joined a counter nationalist group that basically claimed away from, from this statement and this position. And she actually saw the leaders of this group being executed for their opinions. At that point, it was a highly, highly unpopular opinion, both within Poland itself and as I say, international in the international left. So this is important to remember because her education was not only as an outsider in terms of her demographics, but she was always a person who thought differently to other people and who saw people paying the price for that. So that was a really important thing for her life. Um, she was the youngest daughter of a very middle-class Jewish typical family that loved culture, that um, loved music, something she always adored. Um, she was uh, disabled from the age of two. She walked with a limp because of a misdiagnosed disease. 
and she was the family's favorite and was very well nurtured and considered kind of the bright one among the family. And um, she was self-taught in many ways. She taught herself many languages. She, or, she already translated poems at the age of seven or eight. We have um, some evidence of that. And as she grew older, she became more and more interested in economics and in politics around them. And um, she enrolled as a young woman in the University of Zurich. Now it's important to realize that at that point, women weren't part of higher education at all. And uh, definitely not in, I would say the social sciences or sciences you do for, you know, for academia or any kind of related career. So she was very unusual in that sense also. And her supervisor remembers her as arriving at the University of Zurich as already a formed Marxist. So she already had taught herself Marxist theory before she had arrived. And the, there in Zurich, really, she became involved in the international Marxist circles of her time. We're talking about the last decade, basically, of the 1890s, where Europe is starting to uh, move away from old structures. We're talking about about 10, 15 years after Marx, that Marx dies. So there's a big limbo in the world of radical theory and history. And uh, comes along this very feisty young woman, very, very short. I should also say, if anyone is listening and is short and feels uh, discouraged because of that, this is a part I always like sharing. She was about four foot two. So um, no, no complexes on appearance or anything else. And um, she realized there was a loophole and there was a disagreement that she could intervene in. And before she finishes her doctorate even, she notices that there's a discussion that she wants to contribute to. And that is the question of how come the revolution hasn't happened yet. Now, for Marx, for Karl Marx, the most important concept in his theory is the idea that capitalism, it contains within itself the opposite forces that will bring to its collapse. So because some people are getting too rich and other people are becoming too poor. There will be an inevitable clash. There will be a revolution and out of it will come equality. This is of course very simplified, but just like a very brief introduction. And um, at that point, again, about 15 years after Marx is dead, no revolution has happened. Capitalism seems to ameliorate itself more and more. And what is happening is that workers' movements are pushing to rights rather than a revolution. So workers are pushing towards more and more, I would say, alleviation of the working day. We're talking about a time where there was no constraints over labor hours, um, sort of pushing towards more equality in terms of who gets access to various employment benefits, et cetera, but away from the idea of an overarching revolution. And especially one person who writes about that is Engels' most famous student, Edward Bernstein, who was a household member of the Marx family, was a friend and student of Friedrich Engels. And he basically wrote pamphlets and said, listen, the revolution isn't going to happen. Capitalism will just continue to appease itself and we'll have to decide how to um, handle that as Marxists and social democrats. And at that point, Rosa realizes that this is her moment of intervention in the international scene. And she writes a series of pamphlets called Reformer Revolution, in which she says, you cannot subtract the idea of revolution from Marxist theory. You cannot eliminate that. You always have both reform and revolution. And that was the moment she really entered the international um, sphere. As an outsider, as a young woman, still without the PhD, still without sort of acknowledgement, she just becomes this kind of big international sensation and lover or hater. Everyone was talk talking about her in radical circles. Edward Bernstein, like many of the prominent names of her time, was living and working in Germany because in Germany at that point was the biggest socialist party active in, in the international, in the second international, in socialist circles, and that was this SPD. So Rosa decides with the same resilience and with the same determination that she decides to write the former revolution, she says, I'm going to move to Germany then. Um, so she, married, she marries a guy, so she gets a visa in. This is not a modern invention. This was done at the end of the 19th century um, by a Polish Jew and um, enters Germany. She's already very well known, revered and hated, I would say equally. That's one characteristic of her. You can find exactly the same amount of people who love her and think she's a modern saint and people who think she's a bloodthirsty revolutionary and 
you know, it kind of goes both ways. Um, and by the time she arrives in Germany, the, the party is really strong and is developing, but as often happens, once the party becomes larger, it becomes also less radical. So it's important also just a little bit, I'm gonna give you a little bit of like historical asides, just to put things in context. In the 1870s, the SPD was outlawed. It was illegal to be part of the party and uh, people worked in clandestine undercover. So by the time that the party becomes legal, it becomes also much less radical. So when Rosa arrives, to her surprise or horror, she's discovered that, yes, there's this big socialist party, but it's moving more and more to the center and becoming less and less radical and not at all the party that she had considered as a young woman it to be. And from there on, she becomes the left marker of the SPD. So throughout her life, she then is part of the SPD. She organizes within a party. It's really important to say also, she was a party politician. She never worked outside of parties, but she was always the left, left marker. She was the one, the radical on the side. In 1905, we have a very um, exciting historical moment, which is the first Russian revolution. It's far less well known than the second one, which is sad because it's a really, interesting event and it's actually the conditions that allowed the second revolution to happen in which really an uprising that started with mass strikes takes over both Russia and Poland which is of course Rosa's homeland and very important to her always and um, Rosa goes as a journalist to cover the revolution although um, by the time she arrives the revolution is already over and you can sense the disappointment in her writing of like yeah I'm here and like all the excitement is done but one thing that comes out of this that is really very important is her understanding of strikes as something that is mobilizing, as something that brings people together as a mechanism for political education, really. Now, at this time, when we're all sort of sitting in our rooms and Zooming, it's really important to think about what are these things that can bring people together. And of course, we can still organize strikes over Zoom and we can, you know, there are a lot of ways in which these things can still happen. But the actual idea that withdrawing labor is a moment in which workers can educate themselves about the struggle, can understand why they are part of something larger and can actually understand their power. You know, it's one of those classic things that when someone walks out from a job, you realize that actually you were really needed in that job something you will never realize when you are in the job. So that is a really formative moment for Rosa in understanding the power of strikes, of collective mobilization after the 1905 revolution. And um, after this period, I should say also like a personal aside, from her younger years in Switzerland and until that moment, Rosa was in a very uh, passionate love affair with a man called Leo Jorgikis, who was a Lithuanian Jew richer than her and gave her some money for her radical activities. Um, he was not a very talented writer, but he was a talented organizer, which she wasn't as much. So they very much complemented each other in working together. And they worked very closely together from their younger years. Um, but the relationship was a very terminous one. Leo is a very violent man. At that point already, he was threatening her. Um, she bought a gun to defend herself. And as you can, get already from this brief account, she was not a woman who was easily scared. So you can learn a lot by the fact that she held a gun at home because of him. And around 1906, they split up and that is the end of that relationship, which is still the most important in her life. But as I think quite often is the case, this is also a moment in which her intellectual um, flourishing really kind of kicks off and she, really understands her power in the world and her power as a writer and as a thinker. And over those next few years, she both teaches in the trade union school, in the SPD trade union school, that is there to educate um, workers and to get them involved in the struggle. That, that was her life lo long goal, to really get more people involved in the struggle. But she starts looking at another burning problem of her time, and that's imperialism. Again, not a problem of the past, as you probably know. Um, speaking as half British, um, you know, this is still a legacy that we have to reckon with, and definitely is not um, outside of our economic structures. This is really important to say. And um, she starts looking at how the German center left ignores imperialist drives, various crises, specifically around Morocco. Um, but she basically looks at how some people critique capitalism, but don't critique imperialism. And she goes towards her next big project, which would be her most important book called The Accumulation of Capital. She publishes it in 1913. 
but it's uh, basically a lot of her lectures in the trade union school and writing she was doing at, around that time. And this is basically arguing that you cannot dismantle capitalism without imp dismantling imperialism and vice versa. You cannot just look at capitalism locally and you cannot look at international development and not think about what's going on locally also. So this is a really big intervention. She responds directly to Marx, to Capital Volume 2, both in form and in content. content. And um, again, arises the fury of all the Marxists who really don't like being critiqued for having a blind spot and don't like being having a woman doing that. This is, again, some things don't really change. Um, but that really pushes her to the forefront of Marxist thinking. And um, she gained one of the compliments she gained, which I think is justified, is that she was the best brain after Marx. So that's, you know, in terms of intellectual abilities, we can grant her that. But of course, after 1913, her days of glory are very short lived because in 1914, the First World War breaks out. And Rosa, throughout her life, was an anti militarist. She did understand that sometimes we need to use violence as part of. The struggle as part of the revolution, but she saw all international wars as imperialist endeavors, and she strongly opposed the First World War. And um, again, she was a minority opinion at that point. Most of the SPD was pro war and kind of said, This is inevitable and we have to join in, etc. This is a process we can see around Europe, very similar um, approaches. And she dissents very strongly and she's sent to prison for her basically for her objection to the war. And she spends the next few years of her life in prison, where of course um, the war brings huge amount of horror and suffering. Um, she was a hugely empathetic person. She sort of felt the horrors of the war very personally. One of her lovers um, was killed in action. Actually it was a young doctor who was killed in the course of the war. And um, this brings us to another big landmark of her life, which is the Russian Revolution of 1917. That's the big one, in which um, basically all social democracies are being structures around Europe. And um, Rosa sees basically the revolution for which she and her comrades were mobilizing. But at that point, she notices that the Bolsheviks, those um, Russian revolutions who were leading the revolution, we're conceding more and more on democracy. One of her guiding principles was the coupling between democracy and um, Marxism. You can't have socialism without democracy and vice versa. And she critiques Lenin and his comrades very heavily for that concession, something that did not make her um, favorite with those radical circles, but she was a very big supporter of the Russian revolution as an idea, as seeing the masses um, gaining force and gaining um, the means of production. Again, that's the thing she worked for all her life. In 1918, there was a smaller and much more um, centrist, I would say, revolution that started as a response in Germany. And as a result of that revolution, she becomes free from jail. At that point, she's 46. She's no longer the young star who came into Germany. Um, her hair has started turning white in prison. She's very disillusioned. This revolution was not had this revolution. She was much more enthusiastic about the Russian one, but she still thought that every historical process is important for um, advancing of history and moving towards justice and equality for all. And um, at that point, the German regime, which was now a centrist part of the SPD together with um, supported by proto-fascist um, juntas, I would say, that were to be the predecessors of Hitler. So these are groups that then continued directly to work under Hitler, um, really sort of created terror in the streets and went at um, left-wing activists. She was living in hiding throughout the last few months of her lives, life. And in 1919, exactly on this day, on the 15th of January, she was murdered for her lifelong commitment to justice and equality by proto-fascist right-wing groups. And um, her mutated body was thrown into the Landwehr Canal in Berlin. And um, her legacy lives on in various ways. As you could see from this very short um, introduction, really, she touched upon so many things that are still very relevant to us. Um, but I'm gonna stop there. This was kind of a short drift of her life and work, really. Get a sip of water.
Yeah, get a drink of water. That was, um, that, you did a really good job with the, the it's like the abridged version. <laughs> um, I have to say, so I'm new to Rosa. I, um, I just found out about her from my supervisor actually at work. And um, he told me about your book and reading your book, I just fell in love with her. Um, there's so much about her that's so easy to relate to. And I, I feel like that can't just be me. That must be true for a lot of people, especially a lot of women. But I just loved how you brought out her, her huge empathy and humanity and the contrast between her desires for like a traditional family life and her need to do to you know to continue to, to fight um and how she um how much she did love teaching um I used to be a teacher so I saw a lot in her that um I could relate to uh, and she's just so um because usually I do consider myself a socialist and I'm I'm very big um feminist but the history of it and the names of all the organizations get so intimidating. So I, I try, I always get confused by all that stuff. So I usually don't go for those types of books because I just end up feeling like I'm, I'm not understanding it. Um, but she makes it so much more accessible. I think that is, I can attribute that in a big way to you because um, usually I read a history book or a biography about someone who, um, who passed away a long time ago and it just puts you to sleep. It feels like you're reading a textbook, but this was very, she was very human and that really shined through. So I do want to thank you for, for that. Um, it thank was, you. it was really a really beautiful. great read. Um, something that I wanted to talk about. Um, so Rosa is well known for um, the quote, the uh, socialism or barbarism. And we had a really great example of that last week. So I was just yeah. curious, since you're, you know, you, you have much, um, a much longer relationship with Rosa than I do, what you think she might have thought of that. Um, Cause you know, in, in a lot of ways we are supposed to um, fight if we think there's an injustice there, but that, that was uh, interesting. So I, I'm just gonna kick it to you. I mean, first of all, thank you so much. This was this means a lot because she was she's been my best friend for a while now, and it's always sort of great to feel that she resonates elsewhere. Um, socialism or barbarism? I think this is one of the things that really you could take at any period and see how it it just helps us understand. And it's for her, I think it's a moral calling and it's a political calling. But I think one thing that really helped me living with her, because when you write about someone, you really like they really become a very big part of your life. Yeah. For her, democracy was really the most important thing alongside socialism. You couldn't distangle both and you can't concede on either. And I think that's why she gives Leninists a really tough time. Whenever I do one of these conversations with Leninists, they're all like, yeah, but sometimes you have to concede on democracy for the revolution. And I'm like, no, 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 you know, you Rosa said and Rosa was right. So like, don't go that way. And I think, you know, what's, I have to say as in parenthesis, I lived in America in 2016. It was the happiest year of my life. I loved it. I had personally an amazing time. Although I know for the country, it was a traumatic year. So it's always, interesting to have this dissonance. But one of the reasons it was interesting and very nourishing for me is that the conversations I created there um, really gave me a perspective of what democracy is and can be. And, you know, I lived in New York and I went on all the women's marches and I saw people really taking to the street corners and mobilizing from below, which is, you know, that's what Rosa stood for. You can see the great photos, um, go on later, people who are listening, go on Google and the wonderful photos of her speaking to workers on on corners and so and kind of that I felt I saw that in America still there's this sense of you can mobilize and I think you know what has happened over the last four years was has been the incremental weakening of democracy and the fact that you didn't know what to believe in anymore and the kind of weakening of the idea of truth 
Now, you know, Marxism, take it or leave it, but it is an ideology that's founded on truth. It's not, a po it's, you know, it's not postmodernism. She came way before postmodernism. There is justice, there's truth, and we know what it is. And once you start going towards the post-truth stuff, then everything starts waning and everything starts becoming disintegrated. And I think, you know, when I, I, I saw the insurrection, insurrection, and I have to say, for us, it's been really traumatic, you know, being an Israeli, there's a very strong relationship, obviously, also with, with the states and this kind of looking up to big, like to, to the big sibling who's doing things better. And there was a feeling here the following day of horror and, and fear of like what's going on. But I think, again, the weakening of the idea of truth and the fact that no one knew what to believe in anymore. And we saw a little bit of that in Europe. You know, in Britain, we had a little bit of that with Brexit and the culture wars that came with that. And then you had with that um, the denial of um, the pandemic and all of you know that kind of addendum that came with that. But really, once you start taking away from democracy, I think the other side of what I, I thought of also writing the book and living here where I am, Israel, which is a very complicated country, it's not a democracy because it doesn't give equal rights to all people living in it, I should say. But it's a country that constantly on the left, we want to make it a democracy. So I think one thing that we really have to realize is that democratic institutions are really very precious and take a long time to rebuild. And trust from voters takes a long time to rebuild. And you know, I was ecstatic like so many other people after the results of the election became known. But I also thought, you know, this is not something that goes away in a week or two weeks or even two months. You know, this is going to be a long haul. But I think, again, one thing that she gives us, because Rosa was a really hopeful person. She was a very kind of determined person. And I think one thing she gave me, and I can kind of pass on in that context, is the idea that education, being a former teacher, you appreciate this, education is key and conversation is key and keeping engagement. I think once you have these kind of two parallel truth and not being able to engage, then that's when the danger starts. But once you can start engaging and educating and saying, this is something that we need to get through together. And this is not like a wishy-washy centrist, like let's hold hands and concede, but rather we need to understand where and how people come to this and how we can mend our institutions so that they are more resilient and that they can endure through crises. Mm -hmm. And um, I, have, I have faith for America. I have to say I'm one of those people who always, you know, I have loads of loads of friends in, in the States and I always kind of, I'm the hopeful one who says things will come through because again, I see this democratic instinct and this kind of democratic impulse in, in the country and its structures, but it will require a lot of work for sure. Yeah. Uh, if anyone has any questions for, for Dana um, or anything that we'd like to have us discuss, feel free on Facebook. You can just make a comment and it should come through to the chat or you can type it in the questions or in the chat um, on the Zoom platform. Mm -hmm. um, so what, shall I talk a little bit about uh, where we are now with Rosa and what's the future holding for us? Because I have to say one of the great things about writing on Rosa is that it's a really nourishing and generous community. There's loads of us and we work closely together. And um, I know authors tell all kinds of stories, but I've been really blessed by working with a bunch of really very talented people. And um, I am on the editorial board of her collected works in English which is a really interesting project that, um, that I would be glad if people would be interested in and were willing to support or to look at at least. Um, Rosa was an incredibly prolific writer. She wrote four book length manuscripts and she wrote countless pamphlets, speeches, um, all sorts of texts. She was multilingual being brought up as a Jew outsider in various communities. She spoke about seven or eight languages which is of course great for her, but really bad for scholars. So when I was writing the book, I had to kind of traipse my way through various languages that I could barely speak and try and understand what she was saying to me. Um, up till now, we had the collected works published by, um, supported by the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, which is a worldwide um, network that promotes social justice. They don't just engage history, but they also promote grassroots activism and social justice. Um, but that was only in German and that happened in 
in the early 80s, where um, when clearly before 1989, a lot of things had changed um, in the world and specifically in socialist history. And um, basically after the fall of the Berlin Wall, a lot of the archives had been transferred to Amsterdam, where I am now, or at least supposed to be when all of this is over. And um, a lot of translations were now able to be made. There were more access from um, both sides of the wall, former wall. And there was a big push to publish her collected works in English for the first time. That includes both the works that had been published in German, but also works that had never before been translated and published, including works she wrote in Yiddish, works she wrote in Polish, in Russian. She really could speak a huge amount of languages. She spoke French badly, apparently. Whenever someone says like she spoke French badly, I'm like, give her that. You know, she spoke everything else brilliantly. So like she wasn't good at French, like that, that's we can give her that. Um, and it's a really big attempt to bring together her work and to appreciate her really as a thinker. I have to say my love affair with her, with her was an intellectual one. I'm trained as a political theorist and I am passionate about economic justice, always have been. And for me, she has been inspirational as a thinker. So I really, I, I like it that people appreciate her both as a human being, as a leader, etc. But I think really we need to appreciate her intellectual contribution to progressive politics. And for, for doing that, we need to be able to read her work. So um, there's a really big push. This year is a big year for Rosa because she was born in 1871, which means that on the 5th of March, she would have been 150. She didn't even live to be 50. So, you know, she was murdered at 47, meaning um, how much we would have gained even had she lived just a little bit longer. But um, there's loads of events. Loads of us are doing a lot of things around her and the legacy and a lot of work will be published. This year, we have another volume coming out which looks at her revolutionary writings, including a lot of work she did in jail. She was an incredibly prolific writer in jail, which again, I think actually for our times is kind of helpful thinking about working in small constrained spaces, not having freedom to go outside. You know, there are a lot of things that, that kind of, when you really think, ah, she's, she's a good thinker for 2021. Um, so I would say for, you know, we're just in January, this is going to be a very big year for a lot of us Rosa people. And um, I would really encourage you, oh, another resource that I can um, recommend, and this is free in the spirit of socialism, mm -hmm. is marxist.org, which is a wonderful peer reviewed uh, resource that has Marxist writing from Karl Marx to very contemporary thinkers and has a very good, um, very good archive of her works that have been published in the past. And um, could just you know roam free and look at texts and um, learn a lot from her. So that's like in terms of actual resources. See, we have quite a few questions. And yes, a bunch. So I'm going to start with Patricia from Facebook. She has um, a question I was meaning to to ask as well. Um, she says, "Thank you for this great event. I was wondering if Dana could talk a bit about Rosa's view or relationship with feminism. That's something personally." Yeah. I'm, I'm very curious for you to expand upon. It seems like she was um, an intersectional feminist before we had like a word for it, you yeah. know, like she was just very um, welcoming, but I know feminism wasn't her primary goal. So um, yeah. that's a great question. Thank you, Patricia. And thank you, um, Rory, for bringing that up. So um, I would say she was an intersectional feminist before it was cool. But I think also it's really important to realize that she was born in a very different world to ours and she actually died even in a very different world to ours. So she never lived to see women actually getting the vote, let alone, alone being able to run for office. So, you know, when I see young women like AOC and I'm like, she would have been out of her mind excited for that, seeing a woman who was able to gain so much power and influence. Um, although, as I said, she was already the kind of AOC of her time, perhaps. This is kind of uh, reducing her a little bit, but she was the, cele the lefty celebrity of her time, for sure. Um, she didn't see gender as separate from class. I think that's one thing that was really the staple of her time. One of the people she could organize with the closest was Clara Zetkin, who was the co-founder of International Working Women's Day before it became International, Work International Women's Day. 
So um, this was her milieu. These were the women she worked with. She worked with a very close uh, circle of women friends who supported her and who nurtured her, and she supported them in return. She was a very generous friend also. And um, she wrote a lot about women in economic justice, which, you know, for her as a Marxist, this is where, where we need to look. But also she saw the importance of legal justice. And there's one text she writes really on the crux of uh, the struggle for suffrage when she says, basically, the elites are holding suffrage only from working class women because they know that this is the largest power in the country. And again, thinking about the American election and the mobilization of black women, especially, you can really see the parallels of the people who are most oppressed by a hegemonic racist regime having the most electoral power and having the most power to destabilize um, the government. So she was ahead of her time in that thinking, in that structural thinking. Um, she was a contradictory figure, as you intimated. Um, she, she wanted to have a family. She never had children. She really yearned to have a bourgeoisie. I, I think for me, it's her Jewish side. You know, you're brought up as a Jewish girl to, to sort of ma marry a nice Jewish guy. If you can be a doctor or a lawyer, that would be great. You know, that's like the thing that from the 1870s till our days, we still have like that, that ethos. Um, and she, it was ingrained in her and she was like, she really liked pretty clothes. She was very kind of, um, she enjoys dressing up. Like she, she was really good with hats. This is really important. In every single picture, you will see her wearing a different hat and it's a very flamboyant and fabulous hat. Um, so a woman of many contradictions who showed that you can be an empowered and empowering woman without being reduced to a single category. Yeah. And I think she, for me, she was really helpful understanding how we can be feminists without reducing other women, without working in a single category and neglecting women who are fighting different struggles to ours, um, which I think is still very much the blind spot of feminism in 2020, going on 2021, we're kind of on the crux of that change. Um, but yeah, I mean, and again, as I said, she had a very terminus relationship with Leo Yorgikas. After him, she only had relationships with men who were younger than her, in which she was kind of the mentor and the powerful um, person. So um, she was never really happy in her personal life. That's something that this biographer is always kind of hard to live with when you see that the person is, you know, she, she never found serenity or happiness. And she kind of, one of her famous quotes is, I live happily in the storm. And you know that, that kind of embodied her emotional life, but also I think her understanding of gender is very much related, related to that. So that's a great question. Um, let's see. As a young person in the US today, it's hard to know how much effort to invest in voting within the present system versus mm -hmm. grassroots organizing for the revolution. You indicate that Rosa struggled with this throughout her life. Can you explain how she felt about that and how she would talk about it in the context of today? First of all, oh my God, I feel your pain as this is like, it's such a hard time to be a young person in politics, but you really have to keep going because this is like, you know, one day someone will sit and do an event and will be like, you remember 2021, the young people who went and campaigned and did everything. You know, this is really a really big moment. Um, when she writes reform or revolution, she basically says both. We, we need both reforms, both legal changes in structures that make our lives better and revolution. And, um, you know, one of the things we're seeing now around the world is the stagnation of political systems that are not fit for purpose anymore. Again, this is true in a lot of other countries where we saw populist regimes taking hold. This is true here in Israel. You know, we're, we're living in a really terminless time. I was just chatting to Rory before. We're going towards the fourth election in two years. So, you know, it's kind of really unimaginable to get to this level of political um, instability. I think, you know, what would Rosa say? I don't really like when people do that, but I think in the, I, I can take the liberty. It's, it's an important day, so I'm going to do that. Um, I think it's really important to fight both within and outside the system. And it takes a lot of energy and it takes a lot of um, determination. And that's why we need each other. None of the, these changes happen on our own. One thing that I, I learned very quickly from Rosa's letters, by the way, a lot of her letters are also published and are really wonderful to read. Um, she was an extraordinary person, but she worked in collaboration with so many people who sustained her and she sustained them. And it's really important to found collectives that will help you do the things that you need to do and to find those people who can support you and you can support in return. 
And um, I think I see this change happening now amongst young people. And I think there's more an understanding that we have to work as collectives. But um, unfortunately, we do have to work on all fronts. So um, Rosa was definitely not one of those who said, you know, anti-parliamentarism, you know, avoid the system, etc. And again, as I said, she critiqued Lenin for doing that. She critiqued Lenin for going against democracy in its parliamentarian form. But she also really understood that we need a radical overhaul of the system. And I think when you keep the, when you start seeing things through this lens, it actually makes life easier. It's a lot of work, but it also makes life easier because you know every change will both be a really important change in and of itself, but also will lead to a much bigger change that we can look forward to. So there's a kind of a little boon in that. It's beautifully answered. I have another one that I'm thinking might relate a bit to your response to this last question. Caitlin mm -hmm. asks. What is Rosa's most lasting legacy today? What else would you like to see more embraced and appreciated about her? What is her greatest legacy today? I would say non-compromising non non political ethics, to not waver from what you believe in. And, you know, she's very relentless and she was very relentless towards people she disagreed with. She could be kind to them. She was actually, very close friends with the wife of her, one of her biggest political opponents, Karl Kautsky, but she was very relentless in her opinions. She was very determined. And I think, as you said, it's really very much related to the previous question because we're all really tired. This is a hard time objectively and subjectively. You know, it's, it's okay to feel tired, but it's also really important that we stay determined and realize the interconnected nature of all struggles and not say, you know, I, I kind of, give that example when I teach my undergraduate and I say on Monday I go to my feminist meeting on Tuesday I go to my socialist meeting on Wednesday I go to my anti-imperialist meeting on Thursday I go to my human rights meeting and for her it's like no 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 it all happens at the same time and you never neglect, neglect an agenda and I think she really taught me and it's kind of and it's, it's now an intuition for me to ask it can never be a single issue struggle it never really is you know when you look at details when you see how the rights that have been given to us now that we take for granted, be it the right to vote, be it the right to free, for freedom of speech, these are all rights that are embedded within other rights. So um, to look at struggles as more complex, but also to be more determined. And um, to be human, I think she has a really beautiful letter when she writes to one of her friends from prison. She says, I cannot tell you how to be human, but the most important thing is to be human. And, you know, although I'm an Israeli lefty and I have all reasons to be pessimistic till the end of my days, I still believe that we have a possibility to overcome where we are right now. And we have the possibility to inspire others and to be inspired by others. And inspiration can come in all shapes and guises. And it can happen when you go to a protest and it can happen when you go to a meeting and it can happen when you read a book. But the main thing is to work with others and to be open to that inspiration and to be open to that drive that motivates you. Um, and that is for her, I think, what it meant to be human and for us to sustain that humanity. Um, here's a simpler question. Uh, Janet asks, uh, first she said, thanks for describing Rosa so wonderfully. She's a fascinating character. Where can we find your book? I'm gonna cut in first. If Janet, you live in New Haven, you can find her book at the New Haven Free Public Library. Um, we have multiple copies, um, but where where else can people find your book if anyone's coming in from a different state or country? So the book is readily available online. I would like to ask you not to buy on Amazon because Amazon is a very exploitative um, employer. So if you can avoid doing that, support your independent bookshop. If you go to your independent bookshop, I'm sure they can order in. I know a couple of my friends in the States did that and it brought me endless joy. Uh, support your local library, go to the library, read it for free. Um, I'm all right, I have my bottle of wine in the fridge, I'll survive. So, you know, <laughs> read the book in whatever way you can. I think it's also available as an ebook, so you can read it actually online. Um, but yeah, I think try and look for, this could be a good excuse to find your local radical um, or independent bookshop and say, hey, I heard there's a new book about Rosa Luxemburg, maybe you want to order it in. And then mm -hmm. maybe someone else would discover her so um, I have to say as an aside 
I did my book launch. The book was published in August and I, I was here also on vacation. And we did a Zoom launch with one of my favorite independent bookstores that has now become like a little shrine for Rosa because they were like, oh, we didn't know, <laughs> you know, like it's really sweet. Everything that comes out, they're like, oh, we have this book, you'll really love it. So I'm leaving now, I'm, I'm leaving Israel for the UK with like nine radical history books that were selected for me by my independent bookstore. So if you buy independent, it's, it's, um, it's an investment that will reward you. So you can try and do that. Um, I also wrote quite a few of shorter pieces if you want to short introductions and you can Google my name and Rosa and you'll find them easily online. And Tribune Magazine, which is a very long standing um, English, British, I should say, um, radical magazine published sections of the book also. So you can, if you want to taste a can Google Tribune and my name and you'll find that. But thank you, Janet, that's a lovely, lovely question. Another question, besides the fact that Barbara Sokova doesn't look anything like Rosa, what do you think of the Von Trotta film? Ooh, great question, controversial there. Um, I don't like it, sorry if they're fans of the audience. <laughs> I think, well, there are two things there. First of all, a writer always has the idea of what their subject would be like. And although we have pictures, obviously, I have a very clear idea of her gestures and um, her um, being in the world, really. And I think, you know, the Von Trotter film was fine for what it was. It was of a different time. You know, we're talking about a very different Germany and we're talking about a very different era in which um, she was appreciated. I should say also the reception of Rosa had changed a lot since the fall of the Berlin Wall, since the opening of Germany beyond um, the JDR and what, what happened on the other side of the wall. And, um, and that is not really evident in the film. And the other kind of smaller side that is an anecdote, but I always say that when, when I think about the film, is that von Trotter did a film about Hannah Arendt with exactly the same actor who's supposed to play exactly the same age, but they were 20 years apart. And I'm like, dude, that's not a good casting. Like that can't work. Um, I think a lot of us in the Rosa community have this feeling that the von Trotter film shows her as a much more depressed person than she was. She did suffer depression and she suffered anxiety, but she was also, as I said, a very hopeful person and a very resilient person. So if you watch the film, there's a lot of scenes in which she's walking solemnly around the prison yard and thinks to herself. And then you read her letters and she's like mobilizing everyone to organize the revolution. And you're like, that's not really the sad woman who's just looking at birds. You know, there's like two very different personalities. Um, but, you know, we all learn from the people who came before us. So I appreciate the film for what it was. And there's one great film, I should say, in my other life, I write on dance. And there's one really hilarious film seen in the film in which it's the 1900, just, you know, turn 1900. And there's a dance and Edward Bernstein comes to her after the big debate and says to her, Rosa, would you like to dance? And she goes, with you? Never. And it's just so over the top and dramatic. When I was finishing the book, I just watched this on repeat because I was like, I need the catharsis and that was definitely it. So if you want to see Rosa refusing to dance, you know, that's the scene. <laughs> Here's a great question. Um, there's a lot of fear of simply using the word socialism by many in the US today. Do you have any suggestions on how to begin to strip away this fear? Oh my God, that is such a great question. Thank you. All of the questions, so generous and so thoughtful. Um, I think we're seeing that process happening now. I mean, we have the squad, we have people like AOC becoming celebrities. I'm just naming her because I think she's like the biggest representative of that movement. We have obviously Senator Bernard Sanders who's doing not so badly for himself and becoming reelected one time after another. Um, I know that there's a very long legacy of fear of socialism and fear of really the legacy that came out of that era. And a lot of that fear, I have to say, is founded. You know, we know very well that Rosa was right in her critique of centralism within the Bolshevik revolution. You know, it didn't end well at all. But I think, you know, this is going to be like a how to talk to your friend who's afraid of socialism. You want them to listen to you. I think for me and for Rosa and for everyone else, who kind of believes in it socialism is about equality it's about having equal access to dignity you know get to the money stuff later do it incrementally start with talking about dignity um the very simple assertion that no one should be starving if there is enough to feed all of us there's no reason that some of us should be starving and asking for charity in the streets. something that sadly we see all around the world too much in 2021 
socialism is about respect for each other as embodied beings, as you know, we have our right to integrity to protect ourselves, not to be at the mercy of systems we have no control over. And here, of course, I'm thinking about healthcare, which is so mm. important for us. Again, we're talking about the end of the era of COVID and moving to thinking about vaccinations. If you do not have healthcare that is available to everyone, then not everyone can be vaccinated. And actually, this is a good time to bring that up because if you have some people in the society that, who are still sick, it doesn't help you if you're vaccinated, right? This is something that has to happen together as society. So um, I think socialism is about equality, is about access to structures that we all need to depend on in order to live together. And I think we need to get at it one step at a time. I think the political processes we're seeing now whether it's the big strikes that happened in the US a few years ago, that were really a big move in mobilization, it happened when I was researching the book. And I was like, yes, that's where change happens when you have a general strike and then you have young people who are going on strike together and suddenly discover collective power together. Then they understand that they have labor bargaining power and then they can mobilize that labor power, bargaining power. Um, but that takes time. But again, I think I, I am hopeful. I think the changes that we now see in government and the fact that certain policies will come in, whether it's the stimulus, I've been following, of course, the news and the debates right now, and the, the idea that we cannot let people starve. This is not only a, a, a moral position, this is a, just a very political, pragmatic, ideological position. No one will gain if we have poor. I think that's the idea that no, no one wins if we have poor people in, in our midst. And um, I do believe, I think, you know, every crisis is a possibility for transformation and definitely 21, 2021 is that moment of great crisis from which we can transform. So I think it's just a matter of, again, education. Um, also understanding that we're living in a different time. So socialism in Rosa's time is not our socialism. You know, we don't have to say, oh my God, but Lenin, I don't want what happened there. We're not arguing for the same thing. We're arguing for equal access to healthcare, equal access to employment, employment rights, to be able to retire at a decent age. You know, they keep talking about raising the retirement age and you're like, will people ever stop working or will you be a slave to work till the end of your life? So things like that, I would say go with examples that are pragmatic, that would resonate. If you know it's someone who's like about to retire in two years, you'd be like, hey, would you like to, to be enshrined in law that you know that you can actually retire in two years? And you can see even the most skeptical person of socialism being like, yeah, I think that's a good idea. I think like the fear sort of roots back to a lot of history where, yeah. and it comes back to Rosa and, and her beliefs where the socialism was not accompanied by a democracy. Um, yeah. You know, and that's the big difference. Yeah. And I think, you know, in the States, especially, you have the whole history of McCarthy and you have people who are haunted and hunted for um, beliefs. And it takes time to get out of that mindset. And it takes time to, to shift and generations change. But um, one of my favorite quotes of hers that I used as an epigraph in the book is, history will do its work. See that you too do your work. You know, things are changing, history is moving, we keep learning, we keep changing, but we need to be really resilient and keep on with the work in order for history to do its own work also. So we have a lot, a lot more questions. Um, I'm gonna keep going if that's okay yeah. with you. Okay, so do, do, a question here, why was Rose so honored? in the German Democratic Republic, but minimal recognition of her in the time of the Soviet Union? Was this because of the differences with Lenin? That's such a great question. Yes, it was, but also Stalin hated her with a passion. And um, Stalin, people he did not like, he made them disappear. It was like this magic in various terrible ways, but in her case, it was just intellectually. Um, she was already controversial when she disagreed with Lenin. And um, there's a smaller side in the book that I put in for people who like these kind of details that she met Stalin in 1907 in London. They all adjourned after the French Russian Revolution. And he was a young comrade and he had to take notes of her speech, which I found really hilarious considering what would happen after. Um, 
but the more centralist and the more undemocratic the Soviet Union became, the more dangerous she became for them as a thinker. And um, she wasn't read widely and she wasn't appreciated in any possible way because she was threatening to what the USSR had become that had nothing to do with her. So um, that was one process. In the Jedi, it's really interesting. And I have to say, there's a whole book to be written, and I, I don't think anyone had done it yet, but the reception of Marxist history in the JDR, which I learned just by um, working opposite many wonderful German colleagues who only knew one version of understanding history, and that is the JDR version. And I was like, wait, this is like, no one else thinks that way. This is like your narrative, and you think that's the only way, but we don't really understand. Um, she was a martyr of the last, really the last um, beacon of socialism. And she was the person who gave her life for defending socialism from within Germany, which is obviously very important. If you are a German socialist, this is something that would inspire you. Um, but it's a whole different tradition and it's really interesting. And again, I think, and then you go within, you could go within every single country of former USSR and see totally different interpretations. I have. Um, wonderful colleagues in former Yugoslavia who do incredible work on her. And again, very different interpretations of what's going on either in Russia or in Germany. And then you can go back to her homeland, Poland, where um, I just shot a film two days ago. We did like a documentary for her birthday and the cameraman was Polish. And he said to me, no one talks about her in Poland because she's considered too radical and we don't like to remember her. So you have all this arc of former socialist countries that had become completely different in how they remember her. Uh, another, this is just a message, but uh, let's see. Heidi says, uh, thanks Rory for making this presentation possible. The timing is perfect. And Dana, I look forward to reading your book. My parents and brother left Germany in 1936 and came to the US shortly before I was born. The past few years have been difficult for me. So your faith in the US is reassuring for me as a sister, internationalist, best wishes and thank you. Thank you. And I send you my solidarity and um, we have different histories. You know, my grandmother escaped Germany in 1933. And um, I think it's really hard. We, a lot of us, and I think it's true internationally, um, we hold a lot of trauma and we have a lot of fears that come out in very peculiar ways in, in our heritage. I see that in my parents, I see that around me. And um, I really hope you enjoyed the book. It's a great honor for me that you look forward to reading it. But I do hope that I've seen so much kindness and so much generosity while working in the States. As I said, my time in 2016, personally, I've met some of the most important people for my own thinking and for, um, how I see myself in the world. And that's something that whenever anyone says, I'm not the first person to defend America. It's kind of funny when people are like, oh, this and this and that. And I'm like, no, 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 you have to understand. But I do think, you know, I, I love teaching Tocqueville. When you teach first years in university, you have to teach Tocqueville democracy in America. And there's, you know, this aristocrat Frenchman who goes over and just goes, oh, people adjourn in city halls. But there is still that, you know, people still have faith in the grassroots and the young woman who asked earlier, how do I mobilize in grassroots? You know, that is the same spirit. And I think that will, in the end, that will see us through to the light. We have another question. Isaac says, speaking as someone who doesn't understand the history well, why was it that Leninism won over Luxembourgism? Can huh. you elaborate a bit? if you think it would be helpful on the dynamic between what Luxembourg was hoping to do and what Lenin wanted and did. Seems like a lot of strands to sort out, especially considering they were operating politically in different countries. That's such a great question again. This is such an interesting conversation. Um, first of all, it's really important to discern Lenin and Luxembourg from Leninism and Luxembourgism because the person, what they wrote is not the ideology that came after. I would say controversially, I'm not a Luxembourgist because a lot of people who see themselves as Luxembourgists see a very specific and narrow reading of her work. And um, when you read Lenin, you see that a lot of Leninists actually not Leninists. So you have two people who had a very uh, fierce debate between them. They were also friends and comrades. They had their ups and downs. Um, 
they had warm relationships at times. One anecdote that I liked when I researched the book is that uh, Rosa wrote passionately to her friend Clara Zetkin and said, Lenin complimented my cat and you know he won me over with that. So if anyone here has pets, you know, if the person gave a compliment to your pet, then that's it, like they're, they're in your good circle. Um, there were very different personalities in the socialist circles of their time. So Rosa was a left outlier of her party, whereas Lenin was a leader. He was the person in charge of a revolution. And for better or worse, he was then held responsible for that. Um, whereas Rosa, you know, being a critic is always different to being the leader. I don't know what is easier or more difficult. You know, it's a very different position. Um, there were a lot of forces that tried to silence her. Of course, her assassination was part of those forces. And we know that there were partly successful in that. And um, there was a lot of censorship. So after her assassination, there was an attempt to um, misread or hide or translate or not translate or not make available her work. Um, so it wasn't coincidental that people didn't read her just after the revolution. You know, there was a very specific attempt there. Needless to say, in the 1920s, German social democracy becomes something very different. So, you know, in Germany, where she worked the most, there were not that many people who would be keen to read and engage with her. It becomes more and more right wing. And then the left becomes much more allied, allied with um, Leninism. And then you have a very different uh, positions to work within. And I think, you know, when I was writing the book, it was very clear to me that I have to write about the people and not the ideologies. And um, I don't even know which ideology is better. I have a very close mentor and friend who is a Leninist and I admire her greatly and she teaches me a lot. And um, there's a lot to be said for the idea of organization. There's a lot of it, uh, of, there's a lot to be said about how we can bring people together which you know Leninism does very well. There's very kind of operational structures, um, but for me, you know, the passion and the dedication and the emphasis on humanism that Rosa brings to her socialism is something very unique that you don't really find in her contemporaries. So, of course, you know on which side I am of that debate. Um, but I think again, it's really important to discern the ideologies as they had been received and then mal translated and mal treated. And then, of course, Leninism was then maltreated by Stalinism. So you have this whole history of people sabotaging legacies. Um, when I came to my very first research meeting in, in Germany, one of the senior historians there said, you know, the Stalinist had won and her legacy is now not important. Well, clearly a lot of people are tuning in on Friday lunchtime seminar, so she is still interesting to us. But there was an attempted assault on her legacy, and we're still seeing the kind of consequence of that. Okay, we have another question from Janet. Actually, I really like this one, and just as a precursor to asking the question. So I wanted to say, after reading the book, um, I'm a little angry that I never learned about her in school. And I also didn't know that Marx's daughter was a great thinker as well. I only learned about him, never went into anyone related to him. So, I mean, and that's like, you know, we can get into like the gender politics and, yeah. you know, American education and stuff. That's a whole nother um, <laughs> can of worms to open. But um, so we were talking a bit, you were talking about Clara. Um, the question that we have here is, were Rose's colleagues almost entirely men? Are there other women in her intellectual circles? That's such a wonderful question. Thank you. This is like my favorite, I think. Um, no, all the questions are my favorites. Um, there were a lot of women in her circles. It's a really interesting time because they didn't have access to political participation. But you see the amount of women radicals in those circles. So. Eleanor Marx, really, really interesting woman. Actually, it's her birthday tomorrow. It's always kind of strange because the 15th is the murder of Rosa, the 16th is the birthday of Eleanor Marx. So at least we end on a high note, so it's like a nice end <laughs> to the weekend. Um, there was a new biography of Eleanor Marx published in 2014 by Rachel Holmes, which I uh, cannot recommend enough to everyone. Um, she was not only her father's daughter, but she was an activist, she was an organizer, she was an editor, she was a translator, she was a wannabe actor. She was a very bad actor because she could only play herself. 
but she was passionate about stage and she brought that to politics. So she was one of the founders of the British Labour Party, not that she would ever get credit for that. Um, she was an organizer of strikes. She organized the gas workers strike in 1889. And as we speak right now, just started a national gas workers strike in the UK. So, you know, her father's dictum that history repeats itself is certainly true in that case. So Eleanor Marx is a really important, interesting person. They had met once, Eleanor and Rosa, in 1893, and they got on really well. Eleanor was also the only Marx to pronounce herself as Jewish. Karl Marx had a very complicated relationship to his ancestry, but she stood up in a workers' meeting where she felt there was anti-Semitic undertones towards her comrades, and she stood up and she said, I am a Jewess, something that kind of still stays with me and I really, really like. Um, then there was Clara Tetkin, who was perhaps her closest friends, friend and comrade and organized very closely with her together. When Rosa was assassinated in her purse, the, they found a letter from Clara, which I think says a lot about the relationship between them. Clara Tetkin was really the founder of social feminism within the Second International. She really pushed for rights for women workers, both political rights and economic rights. And they were very close friends. They worked together. This is a really lovely photo that if you Google Clara Zetkin, Rosa Luxemburg is the first that comes out in which they're pleasantly taking a stroll together, um, holding hands, Rosa in this lovely checkered skirt, Clara with a terrible hat. Um, but they were both intellectually really important and really interesting. And there's a really lovely collected works of Clara Zetkin that has an introduction by Angela Davis. So if you want to think about why she's still important for American politics, pick that one up and you will learn a lot. A few of her other friends and comrades, Louise Kautsky, also an important feminist in her own right, was the wife of her most despised um, enemy and still they were really good friends and worked together. Um, Matilda Jacob, who was both her friend and her secretary and actually helped smuggle a lot of her writings out of jail, she was a typesetter. So if we didn't have Matilda, we would not have a lot of Rose's writings. Um, as you can see, this is sort of off the top of my head, and that's a lot. Then yeah. going out a little bit later, Sylvia Pankhurst. So this is the brand new published biography of Rachel Holmes just out in America. It was published in December, um, just before Christmas. And she was really, she admired Rosa. She only met her and Clara briefly before Rosa was assassinated, but that kept in touch with Clara. She was a Brit British suffragette. Uh, but a socialist and one who demanded the vote, not only for upper class women, but all women, including working class women, who then suffered the brunt of oppression, as arguably is still the case. Um, so she was part of her circle also, and she kind of looked up to her. And after Rose and Carl were murdered, she devoted the front page of her newspaper, The Workers Dreadnought, to the murder, Carl and Rosa Martyrs. So, you know, the list goes on and on, but she definitely worked with a lot of women. However, we remember the men because, um, you know, Anonymous usually was a woman. Um, and we remember names that we don't necessarily have to prioritize. So, you know, give the books. I kind of gave you a few recommendations already to your teacher friends and ask them to teach. And I can tell you, I've been teaching Eleanor Marx and of course Rosa now for five years and they're a huge hit from undergraduate to all levels and people just really take to them so when you talk about the human when you talk about the woman they really do appeal to a younger generation and to a young generation of feminists so it's a good place to start and we have another one where can we find information about more rosa events so this event actually is pretty spur of the moment i think yeah. it was only a month ago that i i reached out to you right um, I'm so glad you did. So yeah, it's spread the word about Rosa and maybe more librarians will have events. Um, but do you know, because um, you're, so you spent more time doing, with her, do you know? Yeah, so I think part of, uh, we're doing a lot of things this year, especially as I said. Um, I'm on Twitter, the horrendous hellhole that everyone hates and still uses <laughs> for politics. So you can find me there. I tweet Dana Naomi Mills. I'm on Instagram, which is far more pleasant because it's the dance network. I find that, you know, things that dancers use, I'm like, oh, this is good for the soul. When I go on the political networks, I'm like, okay, I need to lie down a little bit. So, uh, um, but we all post events when they come up. We're doing a couple of things in Berlin virtually for the murder. One of the things that is hard for us now to plan is no one knows what's gonna happen, but we have quite a few virtual events planned in the next few months. 
Um, so yeah, if you look online, it's fairly easy to, to find, or you can find me, drop me an email. I'm always happy to stay in touch. Any friend of Rosa is a friend of mine and i um, happy to send her information. Um, we're doing quite a lot of things in March. As I said, the fifth is her 150th. So um, there's gonna be a lot of things going on. And the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung has a whole historical department that does a lot of work around her legacy. And apparently is going to have a Rosa only channel, which I think is both fabulous and also intimidating. I'm going to listen to it and be like, oh my God, I should have written about this. So uh, maybe more pleasant for you guys than for me, but, um, and that's going to air in March also. So that's going to be like a whole channel dedicated to her. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's going to be, it's an exciting year. And because it's, you know, the really hard things that we're all going through together make her more relevant and more important than ever. So it's a good time to, to follow her. Um, let's see. Oh, so many questions coming in. Um, let's see. So this one, admittedly, I don't really understand a lot about history, so I don't know if this is um, about, but didn't the Spart Spartacists hesitate at a crucial moment in the November Revolution when sailors revolted in the North? setting themselves up sadly for the counter revolutionary attack of white guard that drowned the revolution in blood. It's been a while since I read that history. Well, thank you. Um, so many com competing interpretations. Um, the Spartacists hesitated or didn't support what was then the beginning of the revolution because it wasn't, it wasn't exactly the revolution. It wasn't a working class socialist revolution in the way that they had anticipated. It was very different to the Russian revolution. And there's a really great book, um, Pluto Press, which is kind of a radical small press does kind of histories of revolutions. They have the Russian revolution, they have the German revolution. And um, it's uh, Bill Peltz, very sadly passed away just a couple of years ago, wrote the German one and it's extraordinary. It's, it's very much recommended. Um, about the question of hesitation and intervention, I'm going to hijack the question a little bit beyond the specific history and say one thing that I also took from me with me from Rosa is the ability to take history as it comes and um, to work with it and to understand that you can't work in counterfactuals. Now, you know, if you look at all histories, it's, it's really interesting. And of course, as writers, as activists, we always want things to turn out for the better. And we're kind of like, oh, if you had just done this, then things would have been better. And perhaps this would have been better for history. But history unfolds in its own way for a specific reason. And Rosa was an extraordinarily historical writer and thinker. She had a very deep understanding of dialectics, which I think can only be seconded by Marx, you know, and kind of the density of thinking of how history unfolds. And, you know, I, I don't know whether the Spartacus did the right or right, wrong thing at that moment, but I do know that history happened the way it did in a way that is deeply traumatic and affected the lives of so many of us. But we have to learn how to work against it and not to try to bring it a step backwards because we can't do, we can't go back in time. You know, I can't, I wish I could go back to 2016 and not only me having a grand old time and going to wonderful dance performances and spending time at the Martha Graham Center and having the best time of my life. And also for you guys not to get Trump as a president. I wish I could make that happen. However, you know, history goes in one direction. Um, so yes, they hesitated. Yes, the German revolution didn't happen the way it could have happened. I think it's, you know, her argument, which I think is true, is that Germany wasn't ready at that point. Um, there wasn't enough resilience amongst the workers. There wasn't enough organization amongst the workers. And indeed the counter revolutionary forces took out quite quickly. So that's kind of short answer, but read Bill Pelt. He's fantastic, fantastic on this. Um, let's see. Was there, I think we actually addressed all the questions. <laughs> Was there anything else you wanted to talk about related to Rosa or, and I know you have another book coming soon, so. <laughs> I do, I do. It's just kind of been a strange year. You know, it's like talking about history and bad luck, you know, publish two books in a year in which you can't have book launches. But these events are kind of so rewarding and I'm so grateful to all of you for making the time. I know everyone is busy and it's January and 
it's hard on everyone. So really from the bottom of my heart, um, thank you for coming and for asking such wonderful questions. And please do keep in touch in any way that works for you. Um, I have a book out in February called Dance and Activism, which is an interpretation of 100 years of radical dance. It starts with another brave, radical, anti-fascist, feminist, Martha Graham. And it ends with the women marches of which I was part in 2020. And it's a book that I wrote against my will, I can say, because I got so immersed in a lot of really inspiring struggles around me and spending time with dancers. I think my favorite, my two favorite things are spending time with historical figures and spending time with dancers. When that happens at the same time, that's like the best thing ever. Um, so the book looks at different case studies from the US to South Africa during apartheid to Palestine, to Syria, to, um, to Iraq and the Kurdish minority there. And it ends in post-2016 America. And it ends on a hopeful note. You know, I sent the proofs way before the election and I was like, I think things can be better. <laughs> so I'm glad it, that it did kind of, it, it would have been sad if we like, no. Um, but it's really a book that is inspired by the great artists who are part of the book. It's a conversation with many people. There's a lot of interviews that are just basically um, are so beautiful and so powerful that I just gave them to the reader verbatim. So it's been a great honor working on the book. And uh, yeah, it's out the end of February and then the paperback is out a little bit longer. And um, it's, it's I, I feel I'm really lucky. I have a really wonderful job and I meet great people such as yourselves. And being a writer can be lonely. You know, I was just chatting to Rory before we started. I was, I've been on book deadlines since 2017, more or less. So I've been hibernating. And then I literally sent the proofs of dance and activism three weeks before the first British lockdown. And I was like, I'm ready for parties. <laughs> and it's like, obviously the world shut down and here we are a year later. But um, do keep in touch, do keep reading, keep talking to each other. It's really, really important to keep connected. And thank you all for this um, maybe, Sorry, I cut you off. Maybe we can have you back in the spring sometime to talk about your, your other book. I'd love that. Out there. That's great. Um, we do have another question came in from Mary. What, were, what might Rosa say today about our war on immigration? And did Rosa speak on immigration in her time? Oh God, she was an immigrant. You know, she was an illegal immigrant who was smuggled in a hay, um, in a hay barrel through to Germany. So um, undocumented, if you will. What did she say on immigration? She was an anti-nationalist, as I said in the beginning. She was against Polish independence because she didn't see the purpose of nation states at all. So for her, no walls, no borders. Like she was the original no walls, no borders person. And she clearly would have stood up. I think one thing that we can learn from her is to stand up for those people who are treated so badly because we don't even recognize them as our fellow citizens, be it in, um, in the camps at the border in the US, be it everywhere, immigration detention center, that is, you know, it's widespread fortress Europe, as we know, is a widespread phenomenon. Also, here in Israel, there's a huge problem of how immigrants are being treated, both Palestinian immigrants, not immigrants, but rather refugees, but Palestinians who find themselves in different sides of the border, but also immigrants from Africa who come here to work. So definitely stand up for immigrants because they would be the most neglected by the nation state. Uh, just gonna put out one more call for any questions or comments to share with Dana. Um, you can do that either in the the Q&A option on Zoom, the chat or Facebook comment. Um, we have another one from, from Janet. Thanks, Dana and Rory. This was just wonderful. Dana, your students are lucky to have you as a teacher. I agree. Um, definitely. That was very, definitely. very generous indeed. Thank you. I believe that might be it for questions. Keep in touch if people have questions afterwards, after you look at the book or her writings. Um, I mean, always, when something arrives in my inbox that has rose a question, that's like the first email I open before. You skip right to it. The text stuff and the answering about essays and whatever. So do feel free to write. 
and uh, yeah, we keep working. The revolution. Oh, so I should I should end. Actually, let's end on a rosa quote because that's a nice thing to do. I'm going to read to you um, on the fourteenth of um, of January, a day before she was assassinated. She wrote a text called "Order Prevails in Berlin," which was her response to what was then clearly the failings of the Russian Revolution. I'm going to read it out, but I'm also going to put it in the text box because it's easier to for all of us, I think. And that is one of my favorites. Everything is my favorite, as you notice, but this yeah. is a really special one. So the crisis has dual nature. This is actually for the young woman who asked the question earlier also. The contradiction between the powerful, decisive, aggressive offensive of the Berlin masses on the one hand, and then indecisive, half-hearted vacillation of the Berlin leadership on the other is the mark of this latest episode. The leadership failed, but a new leadership can and must be created by the masses and from the masses. The masses are the crucial factor. They are the rock on which the ultimate victory of the revolution will be built. The masses were up to the challenge and out of this defeat, they have forged a link in the chain of historic defeats, which is the pride and strength of international socialism. That is why future victories spring from this defeat. Order prevails in Berlin, you foolish lackeys. Your order is built on sand. Tomorrow the revolution will rise up again, clashing its weapons, and to your horror it will proclaim with trumpets blazing, I was, I am, I shall be. That's perfect. Uh, thank you so much again, Dana, for, for helping this happen so quickly. Um, and, you know, it was great. We were emailing a lot, so it's so great to be able to actually speak to you and see your face. Um, Likewise. Um, hopefully we can have you back again sometime soon. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, if you're interested, we do uh, Book Sandwiched In, which is conversations just like this one, um, bi-weekly on Thursdays at noon. Um, so if this is a good time for you and you wanna make some lunch plans, the next one will be in two weeks. Uh, with Joan Cavanaugh, who wrote our community at Winchester, talks a little bit about the history of the Winchester factories, I believe, in that neighborhood of, of New Haven. So um, feel free to come join us. And Dana, thank you again so much. This has been awesome. I could talk about Rosa all day. Um, we'll continue. There'll be episode two, I'm sure, at some point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>